Gather around the open fire. <laughs> or the old, yeah. the old Joanna. Uh, really? We'll have a sing along. Yeah. Isn't that what people do? They do, yes. Yes, they do. Round about this time of the day, well, the confessional uh, booth here now features uh, Sister Susie from the pub. Uh, we have Brother Matthew from the gutter. Yeah. And today's <laughs> tale, and the winner of a smart speaker, whatever happens, is Steve. He says, Father Simon and the Maharajas of Mitigation, Ooh, which is new. Very good. I don't think we've had that before. Mm. My tale of woe takes us back to 2003. Guilt prevents me from divulging the location, so let's just say it's a large town in East Anglia. Back then it wasn't the centre of culture and sophistication that it is now. Uh, rather, the, uh, the docks area, after dark, was the domain of boy racers in pink Vauxhall Novas fitted with spinning hubcaps and exhaust pipes so huge a small child could climb inside, but obviously shouldn't. No. no. However, in the spirit of adventure, we decided one night uh, that we would visit the east side of this town to shoot some pool. However, disaster struck when on attending the generic nationwide pool hall, it was shut for renovation. Dejected, we started to trudge back to the car. When there in front of us, like a mirage shining across the desert, was our salvation. An independent pool club we'd never seen before. True, it was grubbier and more dimly lit than we were used to, and the sign was hanging off at an awkward angle. But how bad could it be? We paid our money to the man behind the grill and walked in. Like a 1930s western, a definite hush descended as we walked in. This place wasn't used to outsiders, particularly four young skinny men fresh out of university. The room was small and around the ground floor were six pool tables with a jukebox in the middle. Very important for this story. The room was thick with smoke and the beer which was being sold in two pint glasses. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, there, there's the clue, I think. Had been copiously imbibed. The clientele were edgy. Tattoos covering most visible skin and bushy beards down to the waist. And that was just the women, <laughs> says Steve. Oh, dear. Hey, it's the oh, old dear. days. Not Avoiding all eye contact, we sidled over to the empty table in the corner of the room. Heavy metal music was blaring oh, yeah. out of the speakers. But these looked like decent people, and we nodded our hellos and settled in. An hour later, with the others taking a bathroom break, I found myself alone at the table. Wandering over to the centre of the room, room, I perused the jukebox. 50p for one song, or one pound for five. Well, that was a no-brainer, so I put my pound in. However, this was unlike any other jukebox of the time. This was the early millennium. It went without saying that it would be loaded with Oasis, Coldplay and Kaiser Chiefs. But not this one. A cornucopia of hard rock and heavy metal, oh. and I was floundering to find a song I knew. But there, at the end, sticking out like a sore thumb, was one of the greatest tunes of the last five years, Oops, I Did It e Again, <laughs> oh, no. by Britney Spears. <laughs> okay. Through my slightly drunken haze, I knew the clientele wouldn't appreciate the song, but just once wouldn't hurt. I could then select four random Slayer songs, and no one would, <laughs> no one would notice. <laughs> so I typed in the number, pressed select, and... But nothing happened. So I pressed it again and again. On the fifth time, the lights went out. I raised my eyebrows to the hairy biker behind me. I don't think it's working, mate, I said. But somewhere deep in my mind, something should have been nagging. I pressed select five times and then my choices had finished and vanished. I got back to the table where my mates were racking up and we carried on playing and drinking. The atmosphere was relaxed, the metal was even heavier and we were having fun. I'd forgotten all about the jukebox when out of nowhere, doof, doof, ooh yeah, <laughs> and a thrill passed through me. My illicit, my secret illicit song was being played after all. The jukebox had come good. A ripple passed over the room. This wasn't the allowed music. Would we be suspected? Probably, but they couldn't prove anything. It was only a few minutes and then the heavy metal would be back and everything would be fine. The song finished, a few head strokes and a few head shakes. Then heads went back down to take the next shot. But catastrophe. <laughs> doof. Doof. Oh, oh no. yeah! The song had registered twice. This was now unacceptable. Cues were thrown down onto tables. People started looking around. Miraculously, no one had approached us yet. For three minutes, no pool was played. But it was rapidly dawning on me. Not only did we have another three excruciating renditions to get through, but when the song oh, came... No. Okay, a song after came on, the guy in the queue behind me would know that it was me. I started encouraging my mates to drink up. 
It was getting late. We had work in the morning, but they were having none of it. We'd paid our money, and we still had an hour left. The song finished, but this time the heads didn't go down. This time, no time for pull. The culprit needed to be found. Everyone was on edge. <laughs> you could cut the tension with a knife. The silence between songs lasted a lifetime, but with terrifying inevitability... Doof. Doof. <laughs> oh, yeah. In a never-to-be-repeated act of precision, a full beer bottle flew over the balcony from upstairs and landed upright and fully intact in one of the pockets of our pool table, wow. spraying everyone with warm beer. We grabbed our coats and legged it. I dread to think what happened when the song came on for the fourth and the fifth time, but we were not there to see it. However, I didn't need to wander for long. Uh, to wander for long. The next evening, after a hard day's work, I settled down for tea in front of the local news on television, and there it was: a riot in the streets down by the docks. People <laughs> got out of cars to join in. Apparently, it may have been starting in the pool hall, but no one seemed sure. No. What triggered it? The reporter was asked. Nobody knows. Mm. Well. I knew I was responsible for East Anglia's first and most likely only Britney Spears-inspired full-scale <laughs> riot. So I wish to ask forgiveness from those poor, honest people who just wanted to play some pool whilst listening to some ballads by the Twisted Kitten Stranglers <laughs> or whoever it was. <laughs> what? The Twisted the twist, Come on, you're a big fan. Yes. Yeah. The Twisted Kitten Stranglers or whatever it was that was playing. I ask for forgiveness from the passing motorists who just wanted to drive their to Toyota Supras with quadruple decker spoilers mm. in peace the riot was caused by me and my friends as we put on five copies of Britney Spears <laughs> anyways tonight's confession comes from Steve let's check in with the studio verdict sister Susie from the pub well Steve do you know what I quite like Britney Spears I'd happily listen to it five times in a row so I'm gonna forgive you because I feel like with all those eyes staring on you it must have been awful so you don't need forgiveness but I'll forgive you anyway okay checking in now with brother Matthew I mean the, the point should be made if you don't want to listen to Kylie don't have it on your jukebox don't have it as an option it's Britney, Britney. 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 Oh, Brittany, Brittany, and and Kylie, both very excellent uh, uh, f friends in pop. Yes, um, uh, but lovely. And and then you know what's wrong with a bit of Slayer? Maybe he could have picked a bit of Slayer as option number four. Yes, but he didn't realise how a jukebox works, which seems to me to think that Steve is not the brightest uh, tool in the box. Uh, but I am going to forgive because uh, you know if they don't want to listen to Kylie stroke Brittany, then they shouldn't have her on the jukebox. That's true. So it's actually the club's fault. It's the club's fault. Correct. Okay. People's verdict, please. Never mind what happens in the studio. It's entirely down to you. Do you forgive Steve, who's clearly from East Anglia? What do you say? People's verdict, please, on the text 61054. So the Confessions podcast uh, is up there. In fact, there are three of them, and they're all utterly fabulous. So if you feel as though you're in the middle of the night and you need a laugh or you just can't sleep or something like that, yeah. that Confessions podcast is where you is what you want to reach for. And if you have a confession of your own, uh, confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk, inspired by today's uh, story... Uh, which was all about uh, going for pool in a dodgy area of mm -hmm. Ipswich. I hadn't actually mentioned that, but that was... <laughs> oh, it turns out all dodgy of Dodgy area of Ipswich. <laughs> all, all of that covering up. And he just blurted <laughs> out like an idiot. Might have been Ipswich, might have been somewhere else. Let's just yeah, say yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Plus also choosing... Uh, a, it was a splendid story of choosing oops. I did it again in a, in a heavy rock pool hall, yes. basically. So you might have a, a pool or snooker-related confession, a jukebox confession, uh -huh. a kind of wrong music at the wrong time kind of confession. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. you've probably got some of those. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Anyway, the people's verdict for Steve's story is in. Here yes, it comes. Yes, Jerry from Somerset says, forgiven. I'm with Brother Matt on this one. If you don't want it played, don't put it on the menu. Uh, Linda from Nutsford, absolutely not forgiven from a lifelong fan of the Twisted Kitten Stranglers. Uh, Paul in Colchester <laughs> says, Definitely forgiven. Did exactly the same at our local, where we often left the hall after a multiple selection of Kylie Minogue's I Should Be So Lucky. So glad you're back, by the way. Oh, and, fi and finally, Tim and Linda. Forgiven. The atmosphere was obviously toxic. Good job they didn't hang around. Otherwise, it could have been a case of hit me, baby, one more time. Very good. Why yeah. did you use your seductive voice? I there? did, didn't I? Yeah, yes. Did. For no apparent reason. <laughs> anyway, got a tale? Let us know. We'd love to hear it. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Approaching quarter to six and it's confession time. So uh, I caught Matt by surprise there. He was thinking he could uh, probably just hang around 
and finish his box of Maltesers. But um, we're kicking in early here, Matt. We're just yes. running just a little bit earlier, which is a surprise to everybody. Let me tell you. <laughs> smart speaker time. Let's just give out another smart speaker. And let's give it to... Uh, have we changed this name? No, I don't know. Let's just call her Mary. Mary. Lovely. Mary uh, features in tonight's confession. Father Simon and the Forgiving Collective. Where's Sister Susie, by the way? Have you seen her? I've not seen her. She's uh, probably eating my Maltesers. That's almost certainly yep. what's happened. Yeah. Anyway, do you think I should just wait until she appears? Uh, she might be... miss the crucial setup. <laughs> she will, yeah. I mean, yeah. She... That's the thing about being the producer. <laughs> your, your work is never done. Were you eating Matt's Maltesers? <laughs> Matt's got Maltesers. We're now oh, yeah. we're now running late. Anyway, here we go. <laughs> Father Simon, the Forgiving Collective says, Mary, please consider my humble and heartfelt confession. Cast your minds back to the long, hot summer of 1995. I was 15, and my younger sister, Lily, was 13. We had been dispatched... There's a little bit of uh, Famous Five about this oh, story. Really? Plus, also, it's... The most predictable confession. You'll see it coming a mile off. Okay, good. Okay, there's some good. key phrases on the good. way. Yeah. We'd been dispatched to spend the summer holidays with my aunt and Uncle Anderson and our two rather annoying male cousins. Let's call them Hans, 14, and Christian, who's 12. <laughs> nice. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uncle Anderson was something high up in a government office somewhere, army-related, I believe, and rather intimidating. However, Aunt Maria was like a NATO peacekeeping force, and as Uncle was away from home most of the time, we had three weeks of fun. But our relationship with Hans and Christian was at best hostile, as Hans was always a bit of a bossy know-it-all. Christian was okay, but was still a boy. Yeah. Aunt Maria did her best to keep us from all-out war and distracted us with various activities like water flumes, bowling, cinema outings, lashings of lemonade, fast food, that kind of thing. On the fourth week, Uncle Anderson arrived home with a suitcase full of washing, which Aunt Maria proceeded to launder. Uh, lots of sparkling white shirts were washed, then ironed to regimental standards and hung up to air in the no-go area. That's the no-go area, where I suspect... <laughs> we will be going. The, wa <laughs> the walk-in dressing room. Wow. A trip out to select a water feature for their garden was suggested over breakfast the next morning. Needless to say, even Hans and Christian were not enthusiastic about that, so it was decided that we could all be trusted to stay at home after being given strict instructions on behaving ourselves, not going in the no-go area, and then aunt and uncle <laughs> departed. <laughs> Here's the, here's, the, here's the kicker, right? Here's the, here's the big killer line for the opening okay, of the third go. paragraph. Here we go. I had bought an amazing shade of deep plum hair dye. Right, so there we then, go. Yes. <laughs> so this was the perfect chance to use it. Lily was persuaded to help me apply and rinse in the bathroom. I wrapped my wet shoulder-length hair in an old black T-shirt so as not to leave any trace on the crisp white bathroom towel. The boys were in their bedrooms doing whatever boys do at that age. So we, snuck, okay. so we snuck into the no-go dressing room, blessed with a deep pile white carpet, glossy white dressing table and wardrobes, not to mention our uncle's freshly laundered and ironed white shirts, airing and ready to be packed. I mean, what could happen? Okay. Mm. However, the temptation was too great to resist. There was a full-length mirror and a hair dryer. Very excited to see the result, I whipped off the old T-shirt and flicked back my hair, at which point Lily, uh, Lily let out a blood-curdling scream. She seemed then to lose the power of speech and was in a state of petrified horror, with both hands clamped over her mouth, eyes the size of saucers, and had gone a sickly shade of whitish-green. Following her gaze, my life flashed before me. There was total carnage. Plum dye splatter everywhere, and the shirts had got the full force. Summoned by the blood-curdling scream, Hans and Christian arrived at the doorway. Hans mirrored my thoughts with comments about how much trouble I was going to be in, but swiftly followed by, We are all so dead. <laughs> Say that in 1995. We're all we? so, dead. so dead. Anyway, then added, surprisingly, Lily and Christian, you're in charge of cleaning up here. Mary, get the shirts. We'll be on laundry duty. Come on, troops, move. Galvanised into action, a relay of cleaning, shirt washing and line drying, thanks to the hot sunny day commenced, interrupted by a heart-stopping moment when aunt and uncle returned slightly earlier than expected. Huh? Lily and Christian saw the car coming up the road, gave the alarm and hastily met them at the front door, while Hans and 
that I'd grabbed the almost dry shirt from the line and scooted upstairs. Luck was on our side, as it turned out they'd only come back to select a suitable place in the garden for their water feature. <laughs> Satisfied what? that all was well on the home front, they left with a comment that they were pleased to see we were all getting on so well. No sooner than the car rounded the corner than we regrouped. A survey of the dressing room revealed that although the traces of splatter had been eliminated from the furniture, the deep pile white carpet still had a few telling spots. So ever resourceful Lily, armed with a pair of nail scissors, on hands and knees, and a, a prescient eye set, uh, she was trimming it. She was trimming the carpet. Wow. The damp shirts, however, were a different matter. Looking white but rather rumpled and in serious need of ironing, the odious task fell to me as the eldest and female. What? And it was all okay. my fault, but the killing thing, it was my fault anyway. Oh, yeah. So no, there was true. no yeah. arguing the <laughs> yes. point. Yes. So I did my best, and by the time aunt and uncle returned, all had been restored to normality. So that would appear to be that. The attractive water feature was installed a couple of days later. Lily, there aren't many exciting stories with <laughs> water features. <laughs> Lily and I returned home the next week. My conscience would be clear as all the damage was done and had been repaired. And during the great cover-up, we also made a lasting friendship with annoying hands and annoying Christian that exists to this day. So to my fellow partners in crime, I seek no forgiveness. However, my ironing of the shirt sleeves was considerably substandard. And poor Aunt Maria did get a court-martial and was asked to explain why there were train tracks up both arms. And also, how could she have been so careless to get what looked like a spot of beetroot juice on the <laughs> sleeve of one of the shirts? The verdict was that she was never allowed to launder or iron another white shirt again. So it's to lovely Aunt Maria that I ask absolution, although I have inside information that she's been jumping up and down happy about <laughs> yeah, that ever yeah. since. Yeah. I also suspect <laughs> that she worked out exactly what had happened anyway. But I throw myself uh, back on the forgiveness on the Merciful Collective and the nation as there was no malicious intent and great efforts were made to make restitution for the sin caused by a moment of teenage vanity as I went for the plum hair. Yours in groveling anticipation that's from Mary. Uh, check in with Sister Susie. He quite likes plum hair every now and again. Uh, yeah, every now and again. I, I like to change my hair colour up. Why not? Um, I have been there. Nail scissors cutting the carpet. It's an Really? Excellent. I've never done that. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah spill, if you're in trouble. Spill something on the carpet and you're like, oh, just just cut it off. Cut the carpet. Yeah, cut the carpet like away. The shears. Lovely. Brilliant. <laughs> no one notices. Um, I just, I'm going to forgive Mary, and but I think Maria was, was fine with it because I don't think the uncle sounded very nice. So um, no. I just think no one, if, if he had to iron his own shirt. Good for him. Yeah. Should have done them anyway. I so suspect I'm that's the way you. it's going to go. What are you saying? Yeah, do Don't your own imagine. shirts, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Maria, very, clearly very happy about that. Uh, it strikes me that the uh, that the plum dye uh, really did turn the shirts a shade of deep purple and then had everyone frantically washing, so there must have been smoke on the water. So, for that aye, reason, aye. for that reason, I am going to forgive. Uh, oh, yes. Are you pleased with Deep that? purple Very pleased and with that. smoke on the water. Okay, it's Mary's confession. Mary has already got the uh, smart speaker, but it's the people's verdict that is required and required right now. Do you forgive Mary, yes or no? 61054 on the text. You start your message with Simon. You can email if you wish. However, the best way to do this, and smart, and quickly, ahead of Tuesday, 61054 054, you start your message with Simon. Earlier on the confession from Mary uh, about her the co coincidence and coincidence of the plum hair dye meeting the sparkling white shirts to a regimental standard with catastrophic results. People's verdict in like this. So Teresa says, having had my own first share of her murs, she has my forgiveness. I've always gone to the hairdressers since. Uh, Fernando says, forgiven. I think she did her auntie a favour. A and Susan from Tockwith says, not forgiven. I always wash off her dye before drying. Also, no-go room for adults means just that. That's probably true. And a hair mare, is that actually a thing? Uh, yeah, well, apparently. It well, is, uh, according to Teresa. Excellent. Very good. If you have a confession for us, we would love to hear from you. And you could get a smart speaker. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Maybe a hair mare. Maybe there's another yes, one. Definitely. Maybe uh, an aunt and uncle's. Maybe there's a no-go room. I don't uh -huh. know. Whatever stories you have, we'd like to hear them. And another confession for you tomorrow. Well, if you look at the time, you'll notice that it's confessions time. That's what everybody says. It is confessions time. So here we go. Uh, let's play.
play the tune and remind you that if you have a confession, Matt, what do you do? Then you get in contact with us via the email. That's which right, is which is confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Professionally done, I thought. I thought so. Um, and then there's a little bit of a sifting process, which might surprise you, but there you go, that's the way it is. Uh, and if we use yours, then you get a smart speaker, and you can tell your smart speaker to play Greatest Hits Radio, particularly when drive time is on. Yeah. And today's comes from Philip. Thank you, Philip, for today's tale. Here we go. Uh, Dear Simon and the Venerable Collective, as my 37th wedding anniversary approaches, I wish to go back to the occasion of my third wedding anniversary. Mm. So that'll be 34 years ago then. My wife and I decided to go somewhere new for dinner to celebrate. I had recently seen a piece in the local newspaper about a newly refurbished hotel that was priding itself in its fine a la carte dining experience. It was now called something like La Pomme sur l'Orange et un oiseau d'église, or something like that. <laughs> I decided to push the boat out, hang the expense, and I phoned the aforementioned restaurant and made a reservation for the following Saturday evening. Armed with my trusty access card, those are the days, oh, yeah. we set off and were soon driving up the sweeping gravel drive. So we pulled into the car park. My wife commented on the number of cars already there. It must be very popular, she said. However, I was slightly taken aback to see that the swimming pool in front of the hotel was empty and clearly had been for some time. It was coated in a thick green moss. I thought perhaps that will be next on their list of, imp- of refurbishments, and I thought nothing more. As we approached the entrance of the hotel, we were uh, aware of music playing. Sure enough, as we entered, our ears were assailed by the unmistakable sound of the birdie song and the sight of a whole number of people emerging from what was clearly signed as the restaurant, but they were performing the prescribed moves for said song with the flapping arms and the wobbly legs, you remember. It was then that we were approached by a gentleman in a black tie and dinner jacket who informed us that he was the manager of La Pomme sur l'Orange et un oiseau d'église and he welcomed us. We informed him that we had a reservation for dinner. It was at this stage they informed us that there was a wedding reception in full progress and that tonight's dinner would be served in the residence lounge. Perhaps we would like a drink in the bar before dinner. This wasn't called a bar, this was called Le Terrasse de la Pomme <laughs> sur right. l'orange yeah. et was a yeah. d'église. You get the mm. groove here. My wife and I followed him to a small bar that was just off the reception area and was now, it seemed, an overspilled dance floor. I ordered a lime and soda because I was driving and planned one glass of wine with my meal and a G&T for my wife. Having been told that unfortunately they'd run out of ice, this wasn't going well, we took a seat. A sense of horror was growing by the minute. My wife suggested I take a quick look at the aforementioned lounge to see what it was like. I duly obliged and stepping around some dancing wedding guests and a small boy running, then throwing himself to the floor and sliding on his knees, shouting hallelujah. (laughs) I entered the lounge. There were two tables set for dinner. One was set for two people, the other for one. That table was already occupied by an elderly gentleman who had tucked his napkin into his collar, and as he waited dinner service, had dozed off and was snoring gently. Ah. I returned to the bar and gave my wife a description of what I'd just encountered. We've got to get out of here, she said. It was then I had an idea. I told her to just follow my lead and question nothing. I hasten to add that hasn't been a theme in the subsequent (laughs) subsequent years of our marriage. Mm. At the time I worked in the city and in my jacket pocket I had a small gadget, rather like a pager, that Reuters provided and on which two or three items of market data could be displayed. Oh yeah. So it's like being in the wire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So a nice little time capsule here. I removed it from my pocket, waved it at the manager we'd spoken about earlier. I'm ever so sorry. My page, my page has just gone off. I'm on call tonight. I probably shouldn't have booked dinner. I do apologize, but we are going to have to go. Bit of an emergency. Sounds like it's all hands on deck. (laughs) Sorry. So then I realized that I didn't have any cash to pay for the drinks. I apologized profusely again and asked if I could pay with my access card. Despite being below the hotel's card threshold, given the circumstances, the manager reluctantly agreed. Now, 
Those circumstances were that the manager assumed that I was a doctor on call because this is the impression that I'd given with my pager and everything. We were leaving the premises hastily, again picking our way through wedding goers who were now sitting in a line on the floor, moving in attempted oh, yeah. unison and singing Oops, Oops upside, upside Your, your head. head. Yeah. All the rowing and collapsing that went with that. And it was then that we became aware of a small kerfuffle. As we approached the door, we heard, Ooh, Auntie Dot, are you okay? Oh, no. Oh, I think her no, back's no, no. gone. I think her back's gone. <laughs> We'd stepped outside and I heard the manager say, uh, That gentleman there is a doctor. <laughs> Uh, just a second, excuse me, said the manager oh, of no. the uh, La Pompe, La Lorange, and the Oiseau by the Dick Lees, and so on. Uh, Doctor, uh, can you, can you, she's no. her back. No. Well, I glanced round, and I said, uh, listen, sorry, I can't stop. <laughs> try, uh, fresh, fresh air. Uh, <laughs> water, that kind of thing. Towels? Rest. Yeah. I now was running through everything I could remember from my medicine cabinet. Um, call the GP, aspirin, plaster, savlon, TCP, paracetamol, ibuprofen, deep heat. <laughs> I shrugged. Yeah. We increased our pace. We got to the car and quickly left. The next stop was our local Indian restaurant for a takeaway. Oh, the sweet relief of a balti and a garlic naan. I asked not for the forgiveness of the proprietors of the aforementioned La Pomme de l'Orange and so on. They should have informed us of the change in dining arrangements and were perhaps guilty of misinforming the public about their extensively refurbished premises. But instead, I seek forgiveness from Auntie Dot, if indeed she's still with us 34 years later, and her family, if they were, albeit briefly, misinformed as to the proximity proximity of medical help. Thanks in advance for all your understanding and forgiveness. Uh, it's from Philip, who ain't a doctor, but he did have a kind of a pager type thing provided by Reuters, it sounds like, because he was a market trader and all that kind of thing. So let's check in with, uh, well, obviously the people's verdict will be expected. Sister Susie from the pub. Well, uh, Philip, I, I, th there's a few things here that I've got, I've got issues with. Um, it was your anniversary. You knew it was your anniversary. Why didn't you book a table somewhere else much further in advance? Why are you doing it that week oh, for the come weekend? On. I mean, come on. I mean, okay. I mean, Secondly, come on. if you can get a table somewhere for the weekend in the week, then maybe it's not that good because they've still got Ooh. tables mm -hmm. left. Yeah. Thirdly, you should be grateful they weren't poorlier or it wasn't an emergency. And that is not on. <sighs> come on. Pretending uh, to be a doctor, so no, I don't forgive no forgiveness, for it. Uh, brother no. Matthew. Well, I'm going to be a little bit more forgiving than than uh, Sister Sue's. <laughs> uh, a, the restaurant should have been offering a discount because you know you you suddenly you're not you're not in the restaurant, you're sat in the uh, residence lounge. Also reminds me of uh, when I took my wife on a wedding anniversary uh, meal. Uh, she's vegetarian, and I booked us into an Argentinian steakhouse. <laughs> uh, literally wow. sat on cow hides. Uh, so uh, I'm going to forgive. There's a surprise. People's verdict, please, on the text 61054. You start your message with Simon. Do you forgive Philip, yes or no? 61054. The people's verdict. Start your message with Simon and we'll bring you the best just the other side of the news. Uh, confessions verdict in a moment. But what on earth were you doing? More to the point, Matt. On, I think you've uh, you subsequently said it was a Valentine's yes, Day. Yes, yes, I taking think it was. Your, yeah. uh, taking your wife, who's a vegetarian, to a steakhouse. Yeah, I, I mean, in my defence, I didn't know it was a steakhouse when I was booking what was, the... What was it it, it was. I can't remember the name now, but I, I've now realised it's a very, very famous steakhouse. Steakhouse, right. Argentinian steakhouse, and uh, yeah, um, how we laughed about it yes. afterwards. Well, it's a very beautiful thing. She's also a very forgiving woman. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, and we were doing this because Philip's uh, confession was about a wedding anniversary uh, that went disastrously wrong because they tried to book posh and it ended up being rubbish. Uh, he kind of pretended to be a doctor, mm. uh, but then couldn't help out when someone no. got poorly. That's the way it went. I think it was all fine. However, here comes the people's verdict. Yes, Jerry from Somerset says, forgiven at no point did he tell them he was a doctor. He merely told them he'd been paged. Uh, Pam in Devon says, I don't forgive Philip. As Sister Susie said, he's lucky it was only a sore back and not something more life-threatening. Uh, he got off very lightly. Brian, I forgive Philip. However, I don't forgive Matt for the stake and the cowhide. And he's not alone. Uh, Vicky in Northampton, the fake doctor's forgiven, but Matt is most certainly not. Booking an argument Argentinian Steakhouse, take your vegetarian wife to yes. for your wedding anniversary. What on earth? Shame on you. That's the way it goes, there, yes. and so say all of us. Quite right. Uh, thank you for all of those, and your confessions, please, if you fancy one of those smart speakers. That's a big relief for everybody. Uh, new car smell, says Fiona, mm. which is one of those great smells. Could you, sm could you buy new car smell and I then think spray you can. it on your old car and then... Yeah. 
you think yeah, this I think is all right? Yeah, you can. I don't think it's quite the same. Okay, just <laughs> interested to, to find out. Anyway, we'll probably get sent some. That'd be nice. Lovely. Be nice Thanks. Uh, confession time. Send yours to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. If we use yours, you get a smart speaker. Now, uh, the issue here is whether we send another smart speaker. This will obviously be decided by uh, producer Susie from the pub because uh, George, who's sending in today's confession, has had one read out before. So I, th I think it's... Oh, really? Good. So whether it deserves another one or not... Particularly so sinful, George. Yes, yeah, so I think you're, maybe you're only entitled to one. But anyway, <laughs> Susie will have to sit in judgment. Father Simon, brother Matt, sister Susie from the pub, says George, on the 24th of June, you read out a confession regarding the scaring of a railway porter whilst I was a young policeman on the oh, beat in yes. Bath. Your divine jury found me not guilty and I was forgiven. Your splendid listeners agreed. Fathers, I would have to say I found the whole forgiveness thing to be a cathartic experience as it definitely put the spring back into my step. <laughs> However, I find that I may just have to bother you one more time. I hate to seem greedy when there are others queuing up for your healing outpourings and speakers. But I have another small confession to make. Once again, it involves scaring the pants off someone <laughs> whilst on duty. Good. Okay. Hmm. Shortly after that whole porter thing in the city of Bath, I moved to see previous programmes for details. Maybe check out the Confessions podcast. Yeah. I moved to Western Supermare, otherwise known as a cemetery with lights. Now, come on. <laughs> Wow. Very, Obviously very, not true. Very unfair, wow. George. Very, very unfair. I like Western. I like Western Supermare. Just, just saying. <laughs> I worked as a traffic policeman on the M5, uh, patrolling a sector which is famous for its 25-mile-long car park during the summer months. <laughs> so this is the M5. Uh -huh. So this confession takes place on the M5. It was a relatively quiet night, and about 3 a.m. we came across a VW Beetle parked on the hard shoulder. Mm. It had a large roof rack with two funky coloured surfboards strapped to it. Mm. As I got out of the patrol car, <laughs> I saw that the VW had its headlights on full beam and the engine was running. There appeared to be no one inside. But as I looked through the window, I saw two surfer dude types slumped over and fast asleep. Ugh. Clearly, they'd been driving along and getting more and more tired and were unable to make it to the services, so they pulled over for a crafty and illegal... Yes. 40 winks. Wow. My colleague was all for waking the drivers up and giving them a driver and passenger and giving them a ticket for stopping on the motorway. Mm -hmm. So he started knocking on the driver's window, but the two surfer dudes were still fast asleep. To, to imagine them, think Scooby Doo, shaggy types. <laughs> One tie dye t shirt, Ugh. denims. Yeah. Tassels, tassels everywhere. Obviously. Part time beard, multicolored beads oh, around that. the neck. Oh, the beads. other, the other had a caftan. <laughs> A real-life caftan. A real caftan. first confession oh, dear, okay. with a caftan. <laughs> now, my ever-fertile mind hatched a plot. Why give them a ticket? They would only hate us forever. See us as the man. <laughs> the, the, the man. The yeah. establishment. The jackboot yeah. of oppression against yeah. their free-spirited love and peace philosophy. No. Yeah. I mean, you were the police, but, you know. <laughs> I had a much better idea. So, I got in the patrol car. I drove in front of the VW. I then reversed right up to their car until it was almost touching. I then switched on the blue flashing lights, the red flashing lights, and any other lights which would flash together with the sign which said, Police Stop. We then stood one each side of the surfer dude's car, took hold of the roof rack, and started to violently rock the car from side <laughs> to side. It's like a wild theme park ride. We also yelled and screamed like devils. <laughs> I have to say, Father Simon, the result was spectacular. The two surfers immediately behaved as though they were in a zero-gravity device, which also served as a spin dryer. The driver grabbed his steering wheel and started to swerve from side to side, uh, trying what? to avoid crashing into the police car, which was now in front of him. He was screaming out loud, thumping the brake pedal. His passenger was yelling out some indescribable gibberish whilst placing both hands on the windscreen to avoid the crash. Wow. I believe they might have regretted not stopping at the previous service station yeah. toilets. When everything settled down, the driver opened his door and was hardly able to speak. I mm. thought I was about to run into you, man. 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 He said, well, well, let that be a lesson to you, young fella, my lad said my colleague, because that's how we spoke back yeah. in the day. Once they had regained the composure, Barton and John John, as apparently they were called, had been given some suitable advice regarding stopping on a motorway, and they continued their journey. That's my classic 
surfer names, don't you think? Barton and John Barton John. Barton and John John. Barton and They were the surfer dudes, yeah. Mm. In the caftan. I don't know which one was in the caftan. Father Simon and the Divine Duo, I seek your forgiveness for scaring these two dudes to within an inch of their lives, but in fairness, I think they took away from the incident a sense of fair play and would be unlikely to reoffend. I would just like to point out I'm not a serial scarer, nor am I a collector of smart speakers. I just needed to be released from the guilt of scaring people. A darn fine show, by the way, and keep up the good work. Uh, which is a very nice thing, doesn't necessarily get you any forgiveness, but let's see what we make it out of it here. Susie, uh, su producer Susie from the pub. Well, George, I, th I do think that they shouldn't have stopped on the M5. Definitely. That definitely shouldn't have happened. But then I also think you were probably a bit mean as well. So I'm really torn here, because they shouldn't have done that, but then maybe you should have done that, but... Oh, no, I'm not going to forgive you. They they were wrong, but you should have just given them a ticket and moved them on. There you go. That's what uh, I'm yeah, well, well, I think that's probably right. It's very dangerous to park on our shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, in the in the wee small hours, they had nothing better to do mm. than to play a prank on yeah. our shoulder. Brother Matthew. George, you had me at surfboards and funky VW. Absolutely going to forgive Ooh. whatever happened from that point on with your beads and your caftan and <laughs> your obvious, probably, I'm going to guess, uh, predilection for not having a shower and and putting things in your hair. It's like having Mr. Weasley. Yes. No, or... <laughs> no, no, Mr. Weasley. Uh, who was the, you know, the, the, anyway, I've forgotten the guy who's all grumpy at oh, the right. beginning. Yes, I'll, him. I'll anyway, uh, for that reason, I was always going to forgive. Mr. Dursley. Dursley. Mr. Dursley. Dursley. Mr. Dursley. That's Mr. Dursley. Who you are. Well done. Him as well, if he'd been in the car. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yes, I'm going to forgive. Just desserts. It's Mr. Dursley's reaction to all the wizards right at the very beginning of the first Harry Potter book. That's what That's you sound I like. Am. That yeah. is exactly what you sound like. <laughs> People's verdict, please. 61054. Do you forgive George? Yes or no? 61054. Foodie Thursday on the way. But a while back, a confession from George. Uh, George is the copper on the M5 who, instead of just booking the surf dudes decided yeah. to play a prank on them yeah. uh, and scare the living daylights out of them. Anyway, let's check in with the people's verdict. Here it comes. Yes, uh, overwhelmingly the nation agrees with us and says forgiven. Uh, Kev says, I have to forgive. Being from the southwest myself, namely in Bath, the traffic officers that generally patrol the M5 are often not the nicest, so he was one of the nice ones. Uh, Tony says forgiven, straight to the point, which saved John, John and Barton some points on their licence. Yes. And uh, Maria in Plymouth finally says forgive and those two idiots obviously didn't have a Scooby-Doo about the law, so they deserved it. It's our first caftan-based confession. Is, yes. Uh, yes. Maybe it's provoked some thoughts. Maybe there's an often police uh, confession we can't do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. However, if there are some that we can do, we would like to hear from them. If there are some uh, surfing confessions, yeah. then we'd like to hear those too. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. That's where you send them. If we use yours, you get a smart speaker. More coming your way next week. There's a confession podcast for you wherever you get your confession supplies.